This is Sonic Unleashed running on our PCS3. And here's Sonic Unleashed running with the Unleashed Recompiled project. So why is Unleashed Recompiled six times faster than our PCS3? If you answered because Unleashed Recompiled uses static recompilation, you'd be wrong. You see, our PCS3 uses static recompilation and has done so for a long time. In this video, we'll be discussing what projects like Unleashed Recompiled and Zelda 64 Recompiled do outside of static recompilation to run fast and what, if anything, emulators like RPCS3 can do to close the gap. Instead of looking at Sonic, let's instead compare Devil May Cry 4 running on RPCS3 against the 2008 PC release. We can see that the PC version is only around two and a half times faster. If we look at Yakuza 0, we can see that this time, the PC version is about four and a half times faster. What gives? Is Devil May Cry 4 just a worse PC port than the other games? Well, no, not really. The difference lies in how the PlayStation 3 versions of each of these games are programmed. Devil May Cry 4 doesn't make good use of what makes the PlayStation 3 unique from a hardware point of view. In Devil May Cry 4, the PlayStation 3's SPUs are used to process audio and for decompression, but they aren't used to drive game logic or to assist the GPU in drawing images. Yakuza 0 is a late generation PlayStation 3 release and makes pretty great use of the SPUs. One of the ways it uses the SPUs to accelerate graphics rendering is to run a form of post-process anti-aliasing on the SPUs. This anti-aliasing was known as Morphological Anti-Aliasing, or MLAA, and was one of the first forms of post-process anti-aliasing. On the PlayStation 3, using MLAA can be a pretty great performance win, because it means that the GPU can start rendering the next frame, while the CPU is processing the previous frame. When the CPU finishes working on the frame, the GPU is notified and draws the UI on top of the anti-aliased image, and presents that image to the screen. One thing to note here is that the SPUs aren't really any faster than the GPU at this task. It's often quoted that the SPUs were faster than the GPU, but the real reason why running MLAA on the SPUs was a speedup was because it freed up the GPU to start working on the next frame. The problem with this is that in the context of an emulator, optimizations like MLAA end up slowing down the game a lot. Running post-process anti-aliasing on a 720p image is basically nothing to a modern GPU, even with the overhead of emulating the PlayStation 3's GPU. But running the PlayStation 3's MLAA is slow for three reasons. First, the image has to be copied from the GPU's memory to the main memory and it needs to be processed. Then it needs to be copied back to the GPU's memory to finish the frame. Yes, all of these things needed to happen on the original hardware too, but the GPU is slow enough for it to make sense. We can actually patch MLAA out of games and observe a dramatic uplift in performance in RPCS3. If we patch MLAA out of Yakuza 0, we can go from about 45 FPS to 60. Pretty good. If we patch MLAA out of a simpler game such as the PlayStation 3 version of Ico, we can go from around 130 FPS to nearly 1000 FPS, which is pretty freaking awesome. It's because of code like this that games which were famous for running badly on real hardware tend to run very well on RPCS3, but games which were known for making great use of the PlayStation 3 hardware tend to be quite slow on RPCS3. It might seem like cheating to just patch out effects that are expensive to emulate, but projects like Unleash Recompiled go even further and hook into not just calls to the operating system, but hook into game code and replace recompiled code with higher level code written in C++. RPCS3 also does high level emulation of operating system code, but doesn't have a system for doing high level emulation of game code. For instance, we can emulate the video decoding libraries at a high level, since they're included in the operating system, and gain a major performance win over doing low level emulation of the video decoding libraries, which would entail emulating a whole lot of SPU code. But some games use video decoding libraries that aren't provided by Sony, and thus aren't a part of the operating system. For these games, that means that video decoding takes up a lot more processing time on RPCS3. Replacing game-specific code with high-level RPCS3 code might not be a viable tactic for RPCS3, as there are over 3,000 games for the PlayStation 3. However, many games include libraries built and distributed by Sony, or other middleware developers, and those might be a good choice to hook into. One of these Sony-developed libraries is the MLAA library. I was aware of the performance issues this library was creating all the way back in 2020, and developed a system that searches the game for SPU code and applies patches to the SPU code. This is a great resource that allows me to write one patch, and have that work across all games that use the same version of the library. When you're patching games, the patch itself contains an address, or offset, where you will patch the code, along with the value that you're replacing in that address or offset. The big problem is that when you're dealing with updates for games, or even the same game in different regions for that matter, even if the code you're patching is unchanged, if one other piece of code changed size between regions or updates, then all of the offsets will need their addresses to change as well. But, since we're finding the location of the SPU library, then patching that SPU library, it doesn't matter if it moved around in a patch. This saved me a lot of time and I was able to patch out most instances of the MLAA library. In the future, hooking into libraries like this might be a better opportunity. 
Instead of removing the anti-aliasing altogether, you might be able to run some higher quality anti-aliasing on the GPU instead, for example. Let's compare the recompiler of the Unleash Recompiled project to the PPU recompiler from RPCS3. The Unleash Recompiled project targets the 360 version of the game. The PowerPC cores in the Xbox 360 are based off the single PowerPC core of the PlayStation 3, with some special customizations from Microsoft. And yeah, I didn't get that wrong. The 360 CPU is based off the PlayStation 3 CPU, despite releasing one year before the PlayStation 3. It's a long story. Let's first look at the unsigned division instruction. In Unleash Recompiled, the developers choose to emit C++ code to emulate each instruction. Here, they just emit the code needed for a divide instruction. In RPCS3, the setup is similar. RPCS3 emits the code needed for a divide, but instead of emitting C++ code, we emit LLVM IR instead. RPCS3 also needs to emulate the behavior of division by zero, which is undefined in the PowerPC spec. Even though it's undefined behavior, the hardware itself has a behavior when encountering this case. When dividing by zero, we simply just have to put zero in the result. Unleash Recompile doesn't handle division by zero because Sonic doesn't divide by zero. Nice. Let's look at the VAddFP instruction across each recompiler. VAddFP is a SIMD instruction which adds eight 32-bit values, producing four 32-bit results. Unleash Recompiled uses x86 SIMD intrinsics to emulate it efficiently. Since the instruction takes two inputs and produces one output, Unleash Recompiled also emits two load operations and one store operation alongside the addition operation. This might seem pretty inefficient, as each recompiled instruction needs to be both preceded and followed by load and store instructions. But RPCS3 uses effectively the same strategy, choosing to emit LLVM IR instead of C++ code with x86 intrinsics. Both RPCS3 and Unleash Recompiled rely on the compiler to optimize outloads and stores from registers. So while it looks unoptimal now, the assembly code that the compiler will output will actually end up being fairly optimal. Unleash Recompiled is only compatible with the LLVM-based Clan compiler, so it's possible that many PowerPC instructions in Unleash Recompiled end up turning into the exact same LLVM IR that RPCS3 outputs. Now let's take a look at the VMADFP instruction. VMADFP is a fuse multiply add instruction. RPCS3 has to care about accuracy in more than just Sonic Unleash, so it's important that we handle the multiply add properly. Fuse multiply add operations only round once, so RPCS3 will emit a fuse multiply add if your CPU is new enough, and emulate with double precision instructions if your CPU is older. I produced a short video earlier that has an example of what can go wrong when not emulating fuse multiply adds properly. In Unleash Recompiled, it's handled by emitting a multiply and an add operation, which is fine since it doesn't cause issues in Sonic. RPCS3 has one more trick up its sleeve when emulating VMADFP. Since emulating a fuse multiply add is expensive on machines without native fuse multiply add instructions, there's one more pattern that's worth optimizing. The PowerPC cores lack an instruction which performs a SIMD multiply without adding, so games will instead use the VMADFP instruction with an added value of zero. RPCS3 recognizes this case and simply emits a multiply instruction instead. I'm not trying to make the Unleash Recompiled project look bad. They did what they needed to make Sonic Unleash as fast as possible and wanted to be compatible with as much hardware as possible. Unleash Recompiled actually has some really nice tricks in the recompiler as a result of only caring about running a single game. In particular, the assumption that games won't break the ABI is a really nice optimization that makes me pretty jealous. I might have to try seeing if something similar is possible within RPCS3, even if it won't be compatible with all PlayStation 3 titles. That being said, even if it is possible, it won't bring the same performance uplift to RPCS3, since main PowerPC core emulation is very rarely the bottleneck in RPCS3. The most common bottleneck is the SPU emulation, which can't be trivially recompiled ahead of time, and games which aren't limited by SPU performance are typically limited by GPU emulation performance. Across PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 emulation, making use of static recompilation is fairly straightforward. Actually, I'm pretty surprised that RPCS3 is the only emulator of modern consoles that's making use of it. Why is it straightforward? Well, since the console makers don't allow unsigned code to run on the system for security reasons, all code loading has to pass through the operating system on modern hardware. And since we emulate the operating system at a higher level, it's trivial to understand what code is executable and what isn't. That's why static recompilation in Zelda 64 Recompiled is much more surprising. Because the Nintendo 64 doesn't limit what kind of code can be run on the system, statically recompiling the entire game is not so simple. 
because Majora's Mask makes extensive use of code overlays to save on memory space. Zelda 64 Recompiled needs to find and handle all of the overlays at compile time. When it comes to rendering the graphics of Majora's Mask, Zelda 64 Recompiled looks more similar to a traditional emulator when compared to Unleashed Recompiled. While Unleashed Recompiled was able to avoid low-level emulation of the Xbox 360's GPU by hooking into the graphics code of the original game, Zelda 64 Recompiled uses RT64, which has also been seen in the Mario 64 PC port. The advantage of using something closer to emulation is that RT64 should just work across all Nintendo 64 games, while the work put into Unleashed Recompiled is somewhat less reusable across games. I hope you've been able to come away from this video with a greater understanding and appreciation of recompilation projects. The thing that sets these static recompilation projects apart from generic emulation is, perhaps ironically to people not familiar with the technical side of the projects, not the use of static recompilation. It's the amount of effort, optimizations, assumptions, and workarounds put into polishing the experience of just one game. Majora's Mask is one of my favorite games of all time, so I'm immensely grateful to the developers for building the project. I can't show you 480 FPS footage on YouTube, but I can show you 480 FPS footage slowed down 8 times. Playing Majora's Mask at 480 FPS is legitimately a dream come true. The first time I played Majora's Mask was on the GameCube, through the Zelda Collector's Edition disc, which due to shoddy emulation had audio glitches, frame rate drops, and random crashes. I might not be a fan of Sonic Unleashed, but I think it's hard not to be impressed by the Unleashed Recompiled project. The amount of work put into the project is immense, and everyone wishes their favorite game could get the same kind of treatment. The project is so polished that I don't think most developers could produce something at the same quality given the same time frame even if they had access to the original source code of the game. So how does static recompilation differ from emulation? It's sort of a loaded question. Static recompilation is a form of emulation. Let's not forget that wine stands for wine is not an emulator, but if we check the main.c file of wine, we see this little line. Projects like Unleashed Recompiled and Zelda 64 Recompiled certainly aren't generic emulators, but I hope you now understand that they still share much in common with traditional emulation. Personally, I think that generic emulators can go further, and produce something closer to the experience of static recompilation projects, though the effort required is not trivial, and accuracy purists may be upset. Anyways, if you liked the video, please like and subscribe. I'll be making more. See ya!